Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. I'm glad you joined us. Let me give you just a little update on my condition. Some of you have been praying. A lot of you have been praying, which I thank you for, Cheryl and I do. Uh, I've been going back and forth to MD Anderson the last three weeks, every week, and I'll be going every 21 days. I feel great. We're just trusting God, so please keep praying for me, and thank you so much for doing that. So, let's go into in the news tonight. Uh, let me give you this one. It's under prophecy, and it's pretty exciting if you've really been following it. The Ring of Fire Rosh Hashanah Eclipse is coming this October. So why do solar eclipses keep falling on such noteworthy dates? Uh, in 2024, there will be a total of just two solar eclipses. The first one already happened on April 8th, if you remember. It was known as the Great American Eclipse of 2024. And it occurred just after the sun had gone down in Israel and the first day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar had begun. Now, store that away for a moment. The second solar eclipse of 2024 will take place this October on the 2nd. When it occurs, the sun again will just have gone down in Israel. And watch this, the festival of Rosh Hashanah, the new year, will just have started. Is it just a coincidence? that the first solar eclipse of 2024 happened to fall on the very first day of the first month of the Hebrew calendar, and the second solar eclipse of 2024 just happens to fall on the day that is celebrated as the Jewish New Year. For those that are able to view this eclipse, and you won't be able to do it from America, it will truly be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. According to USA Today, the moon will begin to cross the face of the sun at 1542 UTC time. So when this eclipse begins, the festival of Rosh Hashanah will just have started. Will something unusual also happen during the fall festivals this year? Well, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens. But unlike the Great American Eclipse of 2024, the eclipse on October 2nd will not be visible again in the continental United States. So many people out there are entirely convinced that the solar eclipses of 2024 are just completely random events that have no significance whatsoever. And I can certainly understand why they would choose to see things that way. But Jesus specifically warns us, quote, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars in the last days. And in order to have a solar eclipse, the sun and the moon must both be involved. Here in 2024, we've already witnessed a major solar eclipse on the very first day, again, of the very first month of the biblical calendar. And now we're going to witness a solar eclipse on the very first day of the seventh month of the biblical calendar, again, which is considered the Jewish New Year. If that's just a coincidence, it is a really, really bizarre one. Could it be possible that someone's trying to get our attention? Could it be possible that this year is being marked for some reason? In Genesis chapter 1, and you've heard me say this over and over again through the years, God specifically stated that one of the reasons He created the sun and the moon was because He planned to use them as signs. They're for signs, seasons, and times. We've seen this all throughout history, and now I'm convinced that this year on His calendar is being marked for a purpose. Will it be a sign of chaos? Will it be a sign of an increased war? Or maybe even Jesus returning? Well, we'll see. I, I, for one, choose the last one. Let me give you a little bit more and tell you what's happening in our economy. And again, we're getting a lot of gaslighting all over the place in America. Obviously, you've been used to that, seeing our liberal media. So they like to tell us that our economy is doing really well. And it may not have hit you smack dab in the face yet, but obviously, you're paying for higher grocery bills, gas bills, power bills. And so, let me just give you, just continue to give you an, upgrade, an update on what's happening in our economy. There's a couple articles. Retail stores and restaurants are collapsing all across America. It's incredibly sad to watch the United States economy slowly but surely come apart at the seams all around us. There's a lot of places that are shutting down their brick and mortar. Milk Bar and Grill is going bankrupt. Akuma's Corner, bankrupt. Red Lobster, bankrupt, shutting down. Tijuana Flats, shutting down other stores. Sticky Fingers Joint, you may not heard some of these. Most of them are Midwest, bankrupt. Boxer Roman, or Raymond, excuse me, bankrupt. We really are in the midst of a restaurant apocalypse, and more of our favorite entry, uh, eateries are getting into trouble with each passing day. It's very hard to run a restaurant, especially on tight budgets. A large number of KFC locations just shut, suddenly shut down in the Midwest. Dozens of KFC locations closed all across the Midwest this week. Up to 25 restaurants owned by major fast food franchisee EYM Chicken have shut in Illinois, Indiana, and Wisconsin, according to all the reports. At one time, KFC was such a wonderful American success story. But now, KFC restaurants are becoming an endangered species. If you still have a KFC in your community, you should visit it right now while you still can because it may not be there soon. Meanwhile, we just learned that the chain of gas stations and convenience stores in the Midwest have also been closing down. Um, Team Cherie Koss 
was forced to shut down all operations in 25 locations in Michigan and Wisconsin after its uh, landlord, Mountain Express Oil, filed Chapter 7 bankruptcy liqu liquidation on August. So Gary, Indiana, best known place of Michael, birthplace of uh, Michael Jackson is the home to the highest abandoned home rate in the nation at 31.41%. So we have, we have stores closing down, we have, we have businesses that are going out of business, we have uh, landlords that can't rent, we have homes that are being sold for nothing in certain areas. Just listen to this. We also continue to see more signs of trouble in the banking industry. According to the Daily Mail, the United States lost 41 more bank branches in just one two-week period recently. Of course, lots of retail stores are being permanently shut down as well. Now, Big Lots has raised the number of stores that is likely to close to a maximum of 315. Sadly, this is really the beginning of the end for Big Lots because it won't be able to survive much longer. They've already closed hundreds of stores, but that hasn't helped much. And Rite Aid is far from alone. It's going to close also. All over the nation, once thriving businesses are being boarded up. Now I want to inject something here. I heard Kamala Harris the other day, which I'm not crazy about hearing, to be honest with you, because she has no platform and she's just a, she's just a suit uh, in, behind a pulpit, or excuse me, behind a, a desk with a teleprompter. But she said she's going to create in her economic plan 25,000 new small businesses. Did she tell you that last year 550,000 small businesses closed under her and Biden's administration the second year in a row? So that means nothing. It's a whole lot of verbiage that's nothing. I wish people would really understand what's going on today politically because people are being hoodwinked in America. A vote for Kamala Harris is a vote for stupidity. And so I'm going to be very, very, very honest with you. There's no platform. We have no idea what she's about. So I don't want to be too political, but I want to let you know that America's in trouble. It's in trouble economically. Let me give you this one also, not, not to mention domestically and foreign and, and our foreign policy. This one's another one. This says this. Is the media trying to gaslight us about the state of the U.S. economy? Well, obviously the answer is yes. So how many times have you heard that the mainstream media tell you the economy is just doing great in recent months? I've seen the word booming used over and over again to describe the economy and it makes me absolutely sick. The level of gaslighting that we're witnessing right now is totally off the charts. Millions of Americans are sleeping in their vehicles. Thousands of businesses are failing all over the nation, as I just told you. And most of the country now believes the American dream is no longer attainable. Forget about what CNN and NBC and ABC and MSNBC, forget about the, what they're telling you. They are lying to you and they're not telling you the truth. If this is what booming, a booming economy feels like, I'd hate to see what was happened during a recession. I totally understand why the mainstream media is, is gaslighting us. They want us to believe that everything is fine, so we'll vote a certain way in November. They have an agenda and they are pushing it really, really hard. It's insulting to me. It's insulting to think that, that they actually believe Americans are that stupid. And again, I don't know, maybe some are, but it's insulting. But what I'm telling us simply doesn't match up with reality. The following are seven signs that the mainstream media is flat out lying to us about our economy. Number one, survey after survey has shown that the economy is the number one concern for American voters during this election. Number two, at this point the economy is in such a rough shape that even Dollar General, as I just told you before, is running out of money. Stock, their stocks tumbled 25%. They, they are saying that even lower income customers don't have enough money to shop at Dollar General. We should be taking notice of that. Number three, when the US economy was actually booming, Big Lots was thriving. It's an indicator, it's a barometer. Sadly, today's economic environment has been very hard on the retail chain and is now teetering on the brink of bankruptcy. Four, needless to say, Big Lots is far from alone because the number of businesses, as I've been sharing with you, that are filing for bankruptcy has reached dizzying heights. Number f uh, according to statistics, by the way, on the Administration Office of U.S. Courts, annual bankruptcy filings totaled 486,613 in the year ending June 2024, with 418,724 cases in the previous year. These are bankruptcies. These are businesses going out of business, small businesses, big businesses. And, and, and Harris wants to give, wants to start up 25,000 businesses. That's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket, even if she could do it. Number five, according to Zero Hedge Fund, several regional Fed business surveys just fell even deeper into contraction territory. They're contracting, not a good sign for an economy. Four more years is not the message being heard from the regional Fed surveys this week, 
as Philly, Dallas, and Richmond business surveys all slumped deeper into contraction. Six, approximately two thirds of the entire United States population no longer believes in the Ameri that the American dream is still alive. Seven, last but certainly not least, total household debt in the United States has soared to a level that we have absolutely never have seen before. A quarterly report published this month by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York on household credit and debt found that between the first quarter of 2021 and the second quarter of 2024, credit card debt surged 50%, while household debt, which includes mortgages and auto homes, 22%. In dollar terms, credit card debt rose $770 billion in early 2021 to $1.14 trillion in the most recent quarter, while household debt increased from 14.6 trillion to 17.8 in the same period. What does that mean? It means that people can't afford things and they're putting it on credit more than ever. Sooner or later, uh, Peter's gotta pray Paul, sooner or later, uh, it's, something's going to have to happen. While stock prices continue to set new all-time highs, which is kinda weird, much of the nation looks like a horror show. For example, just consider what's happened to Pine Bluff, Arkansas, it's a city. A small Arkansas city suffering from severe population decline and economic turmoil has become so abandoned that properties, homes, are being offered for as little as $400 a home. Pine Bluff, a bleak metro that saw its population drop from 49,000 to 41,000 residents from 2020, 2010 to 2010, 2020, made headlines this month after being panned in a YouTube documentary for Abandoned Atlas. In the movie, filmmaker Michael Schwartz said witnessing the city's decay shocked him saying it seems like every time I turn a corner, there's another abandoned home or another building left behind. Our communities are falling apart right in front of our eyes. Our economy is falling apart right in front of our eyes. And our entire society is falling apart right in front of our eyes. And you want four more years of that? So don't let the mainstream media fool you. The economy really is moving in the wrong direction very rapidly. And it won't be too long before even they are forced to admit the truth. Let's go a little bit further and tell you a little about war. It seems that everything's on, in a, on a knife edge in our, in our world. Nuclear war is much closer than we dare imagine, this article says. It was a sobering title of an article in The Telegraph. The article on August 21st outlines Russian, Chinese, and North Korean nuclear advances and discusses Russia's work on nuclear-related space-based technologies about which few details are known. And again, most people have no knowledge of this. You'll never hear about this in the social, in the media, or even social media. You just won't hear it. I'm vetting all these articles all over the world to tell you that these are major articles. These are major happenings. Uh, the long-term nuclear threat from space is something U.S. policymakers have been unable to slow down. As the nuclear weapons technology of enemies of the West surges, and I mean surges ahead, analysts are calling for Western nations to start to rebuild and modernize their own arsenals and to do so as quickly as possible. The nuclear game playing out among many nations today is a reminder that we live in an unprecedented period with conditions that have never ever existed before. Of course, Jesus foretold that if he does not return, he said, uh, no flesh would be saved, Matthew 24, 22. The possibility of human annihilation did not exist until the advent of nuclear weapons, roughly 80 years ago. Without the hope of Christ's intervention, this world appears to be headed towards oblivion. Yet the Bible reveals that Jesus will return as Savior of mankind in Acts chapter 1, 9 to 11. So I'm excited in one sense because this has never been this way before. The last 80 years we could totally annihilate. Jesus said, unless he returns, no flesh will be saved. That's right up to today's news. Let's go a little bit more. And if you know anything about me right now, you know that I'm totally disgusted with American Christianity. And again, not every church, but American Christianity has become extremely secular. And it, need, it needs a wake-up call really bad. This article kind of backs up what I've been saying. Epidemic of cultural Christians abandoning the Bible for cultural acceptance. George Barna, and I know George Barna personally, and he is ticked. He does all the surveys. Director of Research at Arizona Christian University Cultural Research Center released new data earlier this month that, quote, reveals the limitations of Christian evangel uh, evangelicalism in American society. 
uh, corrupt politicians, I'm quoting, dishonest journalists and media outlets, broken social institutions, immoral religious leaders, unconstitutional government programs and policies, and more have generated nonstop headlines highlighting the decadence of American society and the demise of the United States, end of quote. He went on to contend that the depth of depravity is absolutely shocking. Again, I've been preaching it. And that it's indisputable that the decline is a direct result, listen to it, of the spiritual collapse of Christianity in the nation and its pastors. Wow. The data, said guest host and former Congressman Joy Heiss on Thursday's Washington Watch, also strongly suggests that evangelicals are more likely to be shaped by the culture around them than they are to influence or evangelize it. Okay, I'll say it. My opinion. American Christianity, in my opinion, is a feel-good, self-serving, self-serving meology that mixes very well with the pagan culture all around it. Part of today's issue is that many evangelicals don't really buy the Bible at face value. Many of their beliefs are not consistent, argued Barna. He continued, I'm not saying they're a lost cause or they're bad people. There's a lot of misinformation in the minds and hearts of people who even when you define them theologically as evangelicals, they're not buying into the Bible teaches and they're not living it out. This comes in conflict with the heart of what evangelicalism is supposed to do, Barna contended. Many evangelicals, he said, perhaps get the big picture of Christianity, but they struggle in the sense of trying to apply those core principles of the Bible to everyday situations and their life. As a result, they fall victim to using secular strategies, such as using catchy slogans of feel-good behaviors as promoted by our culture in which we live. They believe, he continued, that the universe was created by God and the reality of Jesus Christ, that he lived on earth and that Satan exists. The issue is not necessarily what they believe, Barn explained, but the fact that it is once you get away from those kinds of Sunday School 101 teachings, things get pretty murky. The nature and application of moral truth, the definition of what the gospel is, and the deeper theological questions that shape our passions and behaviors are things that don't get talked about quite as much in our churches. They never get talked about. And those are the kinds of issues that relate to not only our lives, but also the political issues of the day. Come on, you've got to understand, this is what I've been telling you. It goes on, research shows that evangelicals are significantly unlikely to speak with people who hold different opinions than them. I just came back from MD Anderson and this is not blowing my horn or Cheryl's. Every time we go out there, we speak to people about Jesus. Every time we go out there, we tell them about Jesus Christ. And we've had amazing, matter of fact, our YouTube driver to the airport was, was Muslim and I was able to talk to him about Jesus and he listened right down the line. But most evangelicals are not doing any of that. They're not taking any opportunities. Barna added, the data also revealed that most evangelicals don't even attend what's usually thought of as being an evangelical church. But perhaps the most notable about these findings, here highlighted, is that if the professing evangelicals don't have a biblical worldview, and they're not being salt, and they're not being light in their communities, then they're not evangelizing. So they pose the question, did the study in any way determine what kind of impact that lack of spiritual engagement is having on our culture, our current culture and our society? Unfortunately, Barna replied, it's allowed the media, listen, to become the evangelists of America. Let me repeat it. It's allowed the media to become the evangelists of America rather than the disciples of Jesus who are called to go out and do everything they can to share the love and the saving grace of Jesus Christ with lost sinners. But in reality, what's happening, there's now an evangelical vacuum in American society where both evangelicals and the rest of society are taking their cues from the media, which also happens to be one of the primary forces seeking to silence Christianity. It's indescribably frightening. Ultimately, Barnes contends that the followers of Jesus aren't willing to go out and talk about him, who's going to do it? He added, the journalists aren't going to be the ones who are professing the gospel to America. All this points to the fact that we've got some major issues to address. As for first steps, Barnes urged, the best place to start is within your family. It's parents who have the responsibility of doing everything they can to raise their children up to be spiritual champions, to hear the gospel, to know the gospel, to embrace the gospel, to live the gospel, to share the gospels. That's our job as parents and as grandparents. Consider this, consider this he asked. What's the greatest need for the Christian community in America today? According to Barna, we need to sit back, take a deep and intense and realistic look at our own faith. And that's one of the reasons why I teach an in-depth Bible study. 
because I'm not interested in fluff Christianity. I'm not interested in ice cream Christianity. I'm interested in the real truth of God's word. Let's go a little bit further and tell you that some people are. Thank God for the ones that are bold. Now, if you know this band, it was Three Doors Down. Three Doors Down is a secular band. It's been around since 2000. That's when it has popularity. Three Doors Down lead singer Brad Arnold surprises his concert fans with a message of faith saying, Jesus loves you. You've got to love this. This is where it has to happen. The war winning rock band Three Doors Down performed their well-known hits for an energetic crowd in Hershey, Pennsylvania last weekend, but also surprised the audience by sharing a biblical message. A Grammy nominated and an American Music Awards winning band, Three Doors Down is known for mega hits such as Kryptonite, Here Without You, and When I'm Gone, all of which reached the top five on Billboard's Hot 100 list in the early 2000s. Here Without You has one billion YouTube streams. Three Doors Down is not a Christian band, but lead singer Brad Arnold told the crowd in the August 23 performance he felt led to discuss faith. He made the comments prior to the band's song, Away From The Sun. He said this, the world surrounds us with a message that will never be good enough, will never be strong enough, will never be beautiful enough, will never be rich enough, Arnold said. He said such messages are a total lie. He went on to say this, you will always be enough because Jesus Christ loves you and died for you. Arnold encouraged the audience to repent, to repeat after him, I am the one that Jesus loves. He said he loves you enough to let you know that you're not complete. That's not all you'll be. There's more for you, I promise you. There's more for you in Jesus, and you will win if you trust him. Man, that is refreshing, especially after I just read to you about certain things. Now, unfortunately, I gotta give you some of the moral decay that's going on in America, and I don't like to talk a whole lot politically because I'd be here all night. But LGBT group, uh, Waltz found it wants to trans kids, defund police, and abolish borders. No one knows what this, what this Democratic Party ticket's like. We need to understand what it's about. Democratic Vice Presidential Candidate Tim Walls has boasted of founding the local chapter of an organization that demands, quote, the abolition of the police, abolition of borders, reparations for all indigenous and black people, placing males in females correctional institutions, and transgender procedures for minors without parental consent, all while concealing children's transgender identity from their parents. An LGBTQ website said that Wall's behavior towards a student would get him labeled as a groomer today. A groomer is somebody who trains someone to be LGBTQ. The, a, a LGBTQ group, a website, says he's a groomer. Do you want a groomer as your vice president? Wall's his wife is no better. Her name is Gwen. Is equally supportive of indoctrinating Christian children in, gr in groups' agenda because she considers it part of her religious faith that God created some people gay, I'm quoting. Tim Walsh founded the local chapter of GSA Network at Mankato West High School in the late 1990s. This guy's been at it for a while. The GSA Network codified its political beliefs in a document on its resource page titled Truth Nine Point Platform. Platform calls for the abolition of the police, US immigration and customs enforcement, borders and judicial system, and an end of the cisgenic heterosexual patriarchy. Reparations for all indigenous and black people, including indigenous recreation, reclamation of stolen lands. That means you'd have to give the entire United States back to the Indians. And free and non-compulsory education for every single person. We demand abolition, they said. Abolition of the police. Abolition of borders and ICE. And ICE. Abolition of current punishment-based justice system. We demand for our communities to be empowered or take care of them, care, take care of themselves, no borders, uh, for rehabilitation and healing justice, the manifesto declares. It claims that it builds upon the Black Panthers Party 10-point program. Black Panthers. Uh, we are in a moment which calls for us, they're saying, to bravely and ferociously fight for our communal liberation, which will be launched in the name of our transgender and gender nonconforming ancestors who struggle before us. This is, the revolution is a relationship. The Walsh family, signaled its solidarity with George Floyd BLM riots, which touched off in Minnesota in May 2020, Gwen Walls, his wife, said she inhaled the smell of burning tires through her open window in order to feel close to the revolutionary BLM movement. And I'm not making this stuff up. Whistleblowers say Tim Walls ordered police to abandon the third precinct to arsonists, whom Kamala Harris urged her followers to bail out of jail. Is this what America wants? The GSA Network believes in promoting 
transgender ideology and facilitating children's transgender transitions without parent consent. The GSA network also believes in placing teenage boys who say they identify as transgender in female juvenile detention facilities. Tim Walls has put many of the GSA network's political priorities into action as governor of Minnesota. He signed a bill, House File Number 146, that would take minors into state emergency custody if the child has been unable to obtain gender-affirming health care. In 1997, Gwen Walls announced out of the blue on the first day of her 10th grade English class that would be, quote, a safe place for gay and lesbian students. This is an atrocity. This is something that's unbelievable. Please think about what you're doing. If you're, I know, hopefully you're not out there thinking you're gonna vote for these two people. Please, America, think what you're doing. Let me go a little bit further in, 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 in um, Moral Decay. Indoctrination works. American adults identifying as LGBT approach 10%. What's happening in our culture? The number of American adults who identify as LGBT uh, is increasing, especially among youth, according to survey results. Last year, Gallup polled over 12,000 American adults and found that 7.6 identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, or whatever else they want to talk about. That number is up from 5.6 in 2020 and 3.5 in 2012. Our culture and our nation is changing drastically. From 2012 to 2017, American adults who self-identify as LGBTQ rose from 3.5 to 4.5. From 2017 to 2020, from 4.5 to 5.6. Between 20 and 2021, 5.6 to 7.1, and nearly 8% by the end of 2023. It's constantly going up. The pressure is everywhere. People are, are, are ditching Christianity. Pulpits are not saying anything about it. Youth are not attending church. They're not getting Bible training. They're not hearing it at home. And they're accepting everything the culture says. According to the survey, 22.3% of those born between 1997 and 2012, Generation Z, identify as LGBT. 22%, almost a quarter of Generation Z, they're lost and they need God. Generation Millennials, 4.5%. Generation, Generation X, 4.5%. Millennials, 10%. However, the percentage of American adults who identify as transgender has grown exponentially with millennials more than twice as likely to identify as transgender than Generation X adults and Generation Z adults. Almost three times more likely to identify as transgender than millennials. If current trends continue, Gallup tells us, it's likely that the proportion of LGBT identifiers will exceed 10% of the United States population. Can you say Sodom and Gomorrah? I'm telling you, we are in the calm before the storm. Judgment is coming for America. Let me say it again. Judgment is coming for America. God will not stand back forever. He's got great grace and great mercy, but please don't forget that God is a judging God also. Let me go a little bit more and tell you a little bit of technology. Advanced technology in the coming global empire. Listen to this really well. It sounds almost science fiction, but it's science fact. A series of recent news stories have highlighted the massive advances made in the field of artificial intelligence, AI specifically in regard to facial recognition technologies. According to the BBC, the police used facial recognition technology to scan the, an entire crowd at a recent air show in the United Kingdom, which had dozens of thousands of people there, leading to the arrest of three people. Last week, the Transportation Secretary Security Administration arrested a woman after facial recognition devices detected her trying to use someone else's identification and boarding pass at Tampa International Airport. NBC News, we, meanwhile, reports facial recognition technology is being used as major league baseball stadiums across the United States. And Reason Magazine says the National Football League is also doing it. NBC News detailed the story of Kelly Col uh, Conlon. Conlon was kicked out of Radio City Music Hall after facial recognition technology alerted security to her presence. She was entering the venue with her daughter and a pack of Girl Scouts to watch the Rockettes. Conlin was an attorney at a law firm suing the parent company of Radio City Music Hall. Even though Conlin was directly, wasn't directly involved in litigation, the venue pulled her photo from the law firm's website and added it to their database. Facial recognition technology instantly identified her as she entered the venue, and security personnel showed her the door. This is a world in which we now live. More and more public venues are under total, constant surveillance. Think of the power this technology gives governments like the Chinese, 
Chinese dissidents, political activists, ethnic minorities, Christians, and other enemies of the state will also have nowhere to hide. And as we just read, China isn't the only entity taking advantage of the technology. Sports teams around the United States. So it's the rise of Big Brother. We hear about George Orwell and his 1984 novel, but let me just tell you a little bit about it without telling you the whole thing. In George Orwell's novel of 1984, we're first introduced to what's called Big Brother, an omnipresent, all-powerful, and well-intentioned totalitarian regime. The book's hero, Winston Smith, lives in a world where every single citizen is under 24-7 surveillance. Personal privacy does not exist. Government controls every aspect of people's lives. Monitors in Winston's apartment spy on him when he's home. It, it, in 1984, that was science fiction. Today, this is science fact. Other devices spy on him when he's not home. Hidden cameras and microphones capture his work, his deeds, and even his facial expressions. Sound familiar? It's exactly where we are right now. So what's coming? Well, here's where you gotta put your hats on and listen to me for a moment because it sounds science fiction, but I promise you it's coming. Look what people do today in America. They upload pictures of themselves and their friends to Facebook. Then they tag them so AI systems can recognize them. They reveal personal information on Snapchat and X, formerly Twitter. They set up doorbell cameras connected to the internet and sometimes indoor surveillance cameras connected to the internet. And they set up devices like Siri and Alexa in their homes. These devices respond to voice commands and make life much easier for them, but they also have a down downside. By definition, they're always listening to you. That means a microphone is in your house listening to you at all times, 24-7, 365 days a year. And some of these devices feature their own cameras. So as time that goes by, these devices listen will become smaller and smaller and cheaper and cheaper. And as they become smaller and cheaper, they'll become ubiquitous. They'll be absolutely everywhere. How much smaller and cheaper will these devices become? Imagine trillions of HD cameras and microphones, each one the size of a, you ready? Dust particle. They're working on it. Some might be so small the naked eye can't see them. These cameras and microphones will be constantly recording everything. How, how will they be placed? They won't be directly placed at all. Like dust, they'll spread around the earth and settle on every single surface. They'll be everywhere. They'll settle on your clothes. They'll come in through the ventilation in your house. They'll stick to the bottoms of your shoes. They'll blow through the streets. And this nano dust will send raw video and audio content straight to the government. In the past, all this raw video and audio data would be useless. It would take legions of intelligence analysts a century or more to listen to just one day of global conversations. But with AI, humans have to sit and listen. It'll be instantly processed. So it's a coming global empire. So why does it all matter? Because 2,000 years ago, the Bible said a single government will rule all the people of the world. Revelation 13, 7. It also said the leader of the government will exercise such total control he'll be able to decide who can buy or sell anything. Think about those statements. A global government will have total and complete control over all commerce. To achieve this feat requires a police state like the likes of which the world has never seen. Was such a state possible in the first century? No. Was it possible in the 20th century? No. Is it possible in this century? Absolutely. And it won't just be a possibility, it will be a reality. Government won't be able to resist the temptation. A on other advanced technologies would offer. Jesus himself said, when all these things begin to happen, look up for your redemption draws near. In fact, he said, the generation witnessing, seeing these things, will not pass away before he returns. Man, I am all over that tonight. I am ready for him to come back. Let me give you one last one. It's kind of an interesting one. I know our in the news is going a little long, but this one's kind of interesting. Ants tend to each other's wounds. I love the Bible. It gives you so much truth without telling you a whole lot of detail on it. The author of the book of Proverbs tells this, go to the ant, you sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, Proverbs 6.6. 6. Indeed, much wisdom can be gleaned from the study of ants. New research shows some ants care for their injured comrades by cleaning their wounds or amputating an injured limb. Listen to this, it's a wild. Ants determine whether the injury requires cleaning or amputation based on its location and consistently treat the wound accordingly. In the case of amputations, the survival rate for the injured ant increases from about 40% to 90% or higher. A wound cleaning increases the survival rate from 15% to 75%. Etymologists recognize the benefit to the colony of such medical care and are quick to attribute the practice to evolutionary development. 
Yet the ant's leg amputations take from 40 minutes to three hours. Are you kidding me? As the lead researcher author, author noted, the level of care is the most sophisticated in the animal kingdom rivaled only by our own. The idea that such an advanced system arose by natural selection or evolution, acting on randomly mutated mutation, rightly strains your credulity. However, the same God who instructed us to gain wisdom by observing the ants also noted that his existence can be clearly seen in his creation, Romans 1.20. So it's far more, far more far-fetched to assume ants possess incredible foresight than to, than to mindless evolutionary process or to suggest the involvement of an all-wise designer. God designed those ants. Solomon said, you may want to consider them. They know some things you don't. We're going to go into our study tonight. And tonight I'm going to give you a little bit of a, an understanding of where this is going. I really wish that a lot of people would, would listen tonight. And if you hear this, you really need to share it with, with people. One of the most asked questions I've received in my tenure as a pastor over the last 40 years is, who is Melchizedek? Well, tonight we're going to detail who Melchizedek is. And I'm going to give you a theory of mine. I'm, I'm going to be very, very uh, upfront with you that that is my theory. I'll tell you where the theory begins and I'll tell you about it. But first of all, let's go into this Genesis chapter 14 study. Part two, we will finish the chapter tonight. Abraham, it'll be about Abraham and the battle of Siddim. Most people, I might tell people about this and we teach it, say, I never heard of this. Well, it's in your Bible. We last left Abram with a dilemma. His brother's son, Lot, lived in Sodom, and Sodom was part of a five-king kingdom. It was a very, very plush area down by what we now know is the Dead Sea, which wasn't there. It was a fertile valley, the Valley of Siddim. They were paying, this, these five kings down in that valley of five cities were paying high taxes to a much larger eastern kingdom of four kings in the east that actually ruled the world. But the five kings of the south of the Valley of Siddim rebelled in the 13th year, and the four kings of the east came down to conquer them in the Valley of Siddim. Now, why did they pay so much taxes? Because they were on, they controlled the King's Highway. King's Highway connects three continents, still does. And so lots of commerce, lots of money came. So when they rebelled, these, these, kings of the east, these five kings of the east came down and to, and to conquer them. We know that, we've shared you this, these are the valley, now again, the Dead Sea wasn't there. I'm pointing to this chart in the middle. You see the valley right here, Gomorrah, Zebulun, Adama, Sodom, these are the, and, and Siddim. These are the five kings of the south of the Valley of Siddim. Off the map here to the right, you'll see I wrote four kings of the east. That's off the map, and we've talked about this last week. Here they are again. So this one controlled, these four kings of the east controlled the, pretty much the whole world at that time, the known world. And these are right here very prosperous in the Valley of Siddim. So as we see these happening, we see that these are going to come down. Some of them call them the Hittites, Eleazar, the kings, and Chedorlaomer is the leader of all of those four kings to the east. So they're going to come down and they're going to conquer the, the people of the valley, the kings of the valley. Abram is right smack dab in the middle. If you look at this chart between that red and blue, blue uh, arrow, Right there in the middle is Abram. He's not really involved at all in this, in this war that's going on. He could have listened to his internal flesh and pass it off as God's judgment on Sodom and Lot and do absolutely nothing. We told you we fight three things. The internal is one of them. He could have done nothing. Or he could have passed it off as a worldly, an external. He would fight the external. An external problem. And again, that he had nothing to do with. But as we left off last week, after the five kings conquer, they will conquer the four kings of the south. They take all of their possessions and all of the people and Lot and his family and they start to head back north, obviously to go northeast. What's Abram's response? Well, he doesn't have to get involved at all, but he gets directly involved. And here's where we pick it up. Now, when Abram heard that his brother was taken, again, when it says brother, it's his brother's son Lot. We know that. When his brother was taken captive, he, uh, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Abram had a small army. He's arming his servants, 318 of them. Now, follow. After he follows, after he gets directly involved and follows after the conquering kings all the way to the north, as we told you last week, to the, what's called the gates of Dan. They are still there. This is the oldest mud gate in the world. This is the gate that Abram went through. This is the gate that the kings went through. This is how you get out of northern Israel and back into what we know as Syria and beyond. Then as one born to lead, 
Abram, and there, there's that gate. Abram divides his army. Look at this map. Look at the red dots there in the middle. So, they, so they, they, the kings of the east destroy and conquer the kings of the south in Siddim. They start to go back north. And look at this. There's the red arrow right there in the middle. It's the gate of Dan. Abram starts to fall then from Hebron. He, he divides his, own, his army. It's a pincer move. This man is unbelievable. He is using a pincer move. He's dividing his army so that he can conquer these kings of the north and take back everything that they've stolen. So he divides his army and Genesis 14 tells us what happens. He divides his forces against them by night. He is a shrewd uh, general. And he and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Hobah. Notice that he's part of the attack, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods, also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. He actually overtakes them and conquers them. He goes as far as Hobah. Here's Damascus. Damascus today is in Syria. He divides his army right past Dan. He goes all the way, if you look to the right-hand side of his chart, to Hobah, and that's where he overtakes them before they can get back to the east. This is powerful. This was a world war, by the way, and this was a massive thing, and Abram is the one that's going to conquer those kings of the east and take back everything that they took from the five kings of the south. So he pursues them again as far as Hobah, north of Damascus, Syria today. Then as one born to be a leader again, Abraham divides his army, again, a pincer move, and he attacks at night, pursuing the waking enemy and killing them as they ran away. The victory is absolutely incredible and can only be explained in God terms. And not only did he re rescue Lot, but all the people taken, plus a vast amount of spoils. So he takes it all back. Listen, Satan loves to take what's ours. God not only wants us to take back what's ours, but everything else we can in the battle. So we've seen Abram fight the two fights to gain victory in his faith. He fought the, the internal, his flesh, he fought the external, the world, but there's another battle coming up, and that battle it was what we call the infernal. Satan's not done yet. He's already, he's already fought the internal, his flesh told him not to get involved, but he did. He fought the external, he went against the, the, the uh, enemy, and now it's the infernal. What next test will come for him? It's the wiles of the devil. Let's look at it. Because here it is. Genesis 7, 14, 17 to 20. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheba, that is, the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedalor Ramer. And the kings were with him. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, here's Melchizedek, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram the God of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tithe of all. Abram tithed to Melchizedek. So interesting, cryptic, lots of controversy over it. We're going to take it apart tonight. The, in a few moments, a peculiar form of temptation will be put to Abraham when the king of Sodom approaches him, whom Abraham rescued. But first, let's talk about Melchizedek. Melchizedek the king of Salem. He is a king of a kingdom, a priest king, and one of the great types of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. So, okay, look where we are right now. Let me review with you for a moment. So, when? When Abraham was born, approximately 1996 BC, died 1821 BC, at 170 years old, the events recorded in Genesis 14 happened sometime between 1921 and 1896 BC. The characters, Abram, a man from Ur of the Chaldees, who moved to Canaan of God's instruction. God promised to bless all the nations of the earth through his descendants. Lot, we know it's Abraham's nephew's son, excuse me, Abraham's nephew, his, his brother's son, who lived near the city of Sodom. Nine warring kings, five from, the, five from the south, four from the east. Melchizedek, king of Salem, and priest of God, of God Most High. Where? The key battle discusses in this chapter occurred in the Valley of Siddim. Abram pursues the nephew all the way up to Damascus and beyond and takes them all back. So that's where we are so far. Now, look at what happens. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High. He sets bread and wine before Abram. This is after Abram defeats the kings of the east and takes all the, all the spoils of war and all the people back. It's a type of body and blood. It's a symbol of Calvary. It's a symbol of Christ. Melchizedek calls Abraham possessor of heaven and earth. It means 
he, he, one who can buy in both places. He's able to purchase things in earth and purchase things in heaven. It's really a powerful statement. You see, just as we glance backward at the emblems, the bread and the wine, Abram looked to the future through the emblems. This is a prophecy of Christ. This is the first communion ever mentioned in scripture. So who is this Melchizedek? There's been controversy everywhere. Some believe that Noah's son Shem, who is still alive, is Melchizedek. Now, you'll have to do this on your own, but on this chart, if you look at the blue lines, go all the way down here to Abram, the fourth from the bottom. And if you draw a line straight up, you'll see that some of the patriarchs are still living. Shem's still alive during, Ab during Abram's life. So is our facts ad. So is Selah, and so is Eber. Peleg, Rehu, Sarek, Nahor, and Tera are all dead, but some of the patriarchs are still alive. They lived hundreds of years. They're alive when Abraham's alive. I've showed you this before. There's another chart to show it to you. So we know that as the Bible tells their ages, we know that it overlaps. So who's this Melchizedek? Now again, who do I think he was? Well, since Shem, Noah's son, outlived Abraham by another 32 years, some believe Shem was Melchizedek. I don't think so because of a lot of things, namely what Paul tells us in Hebrews. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abram gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem. He's given us a description here of Melchizedek, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continue. Man, no wonder why people get all messed up. Who is this Melchizedek? So some people say it's Seth. It's definitely not Seth. And I'll tell you why. So get ready. Here's what I think based on scripture. Number one, Melchizedek is the king of Salem. That's Jerusalem. If you've been following our maps, you'll know that the Valley of Siddim was down here where the Dead Sea is, it's south. You know, that's where the five kings were. The four kings were over here. Abram's living in Hebron, and Jerusalem's kind of in the middle of this. It has nothing to do with this war. So this Melchizedek is a king of Salem. Is it Shem, who's still alive? Well, Paul tells us in Hebrews that Melchizedek is the king of Salem. He's the king of Jerusalem, the king of righteousness. Only Jesus is called the king of righteousness in Scripture three times. He's the king of peace. Only Jesus is called the King of Peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, with no beginning and no end of life, made like unto the Son of God, a, pri a priest continued. It cannot be Shem, who along with Arphaxad, Salah, and Eber, the ones that came from him, probably lived in Jerusalem. So where did these, where did these people live? We talked about Abraham and his coming out of Ur of the Chaldees, and the Bible says in Joshua that Abraham's fathers were idol worshippers all the way back to Sarug. But before Sarug, the ones that were living, where were they? Where were the ones I just told you were alive? Where was Shem, our facts had Selah and Eber living? Where were they living? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us, but I'm gonna to suggest to you that they were living in Jerusalem. I'm gonna to suggest to you that's where they were. These were the holy men of old. They were living there. Again, remember, uh, Eber, they probably lived in Jerusalem. Pele, Grehu, Sarug, and Nahor, and Dera, Abram's father were idol worshippers living in Ur the Chaldee, Joshua 24.2. It cannot be Shem, because he has a father. His father's name was Noah. It can't be Shem, because he has a mother. His mother's name was Mrs. Noah. It cannot be Shem, he has a descent, he has a lineage. I showed it to you, there's his lineage. He can't, without descent, he has a descent, he has a lineage. Matter of fact, his lineage goes all the way to Jesus. It can't be Shem, he was born about 1558 BC, and he died at 2158 BC, 600 years old. He had beginning of days and end of days. Okay, so now here's my theory. And again, it's my theory. Just listen to it, because the Bible, I'm kind of deducting things from the Bible. So where was Shem, our facts added, Selah, and Eber, the ones before the idol worshippers who lived in Ur of the Chaldees? Where was Shem and, his, and part of his lineage living? My biblical guess, Salem. They were living in Jerusalem. They were worshiping God there. Probably had an altar, maybe a rough temple. We're not told that in scripture, but they had to be living somewhere, and they were righteous. So here's my theory. First, I definitely believe that Melchizedek was a Christophany, Christ in the Old Testament, appearing as a man. And I believe he was the king of Salem. 
And maybe he appeared at times to Shem and the righteous. I get chills thinking of it. And I believe Abram knew this to be so. Why would he go to Jerusalem after this? Why would he go there? He knows something's there. So why would he go? Why would he go to the king of Salem? He knows that something's there. And he goes there to offer tithes. And Melchizedek, Jesus, who I believe was appearing every now and then, not always, but every now and then, shares the very first communion ever with him, the bread and wine, as a look to a future. It's powerful. It's God showing us his story way back in Genesis 14. What does Melchizedek do? He blesses him. And Melchizedek is called the priest of the Most High God. Only Christ is called that. Wow, just imagine. Now we're not directly told it's Jesus, but putting it all together, I can see through scripture and the deduction of where Shem lived in Jerusalem, that these righteous of Shem must have seen Jesus at times in Jerusalem and know, knew that he was the image of God, made like the son of God, Hebrews tells us. So when Abraham met, met Melchizedek, his response was immediate and spiritual. He gave tithes. 10% of all he held. It opened an account in heaven and in earth. Then Abram is blessed and refreshed, and most people miss it, but he receives more revelation from God. Here it is. Possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God of most high, El Elyon. Now let me tell you why I'm highlighting that. El Elyon there, if you know the word of, the word of God, the Bible is really, a, it's really a, an explanation of who God is. It, in the Bible, 11,000 names of, 11,000 times, the name of God in one shape or another is related. 11,000 times. And it's a progression. We know that God, Elohim, for God made heaven and earth, Elohim. In the beginning, God, Elohim, plural God. Then as we go along, we start seeing more and more names of God. It's like you meeting somebody. Let's say your wife or your husband. The first time you meet them, you hear their full name. I remember Cheryl, Cheryl Hoke. But as I became closer to her, she became Cher, and then eventually Cheryl Carell, and then the little pet names came. More and more intimate, we became more and more names. That's the whole story of the Bible. God wants to reveal himself to mankind. So here we have the, another name for God. First time it's ever appeared, El Elyon. It's one of the reasons why I've highlighted it. It's a new name for God, brand new. It means the God who ascends into the heavens. Now, why would I tell you that? Let me go with my theory. I think Jesus was the king of Salem. I think Abraham saw him ascending and descending. I think Shem saw him the same way. And man, I get chills thinking about it. Can you imagine him seeing Jesus? That's why the El Elyon name is there, in my opinion. The one who ascends and descends into heaven. I believe Abraham saw Jesus lift off and go into heaven. And maybe Shem and them saw him come back every now and then. Now the test for Abraham and for us, after this fresh revelation, Will we return to live in our world forgetting what we've just experienced? Abram's obviously experienced great victory. He's obviously experienced a, a, tremendous, a tremendous opportunity. He's experienced God. I believe he's experienced Christophany, Christ. I believe he saw Jesus ascend and descend into heaven. He gives tithes to him. He's blessed, by the, called the possessor of heaven and earth, able to buy in earth and in heaven, having two accounts. This is something powerful. So what will he do after this? Where does he go after this? Well, Genesis 14, I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am giving it. Genesis 14, 21 to 24. Now the king of Sodom, remember he's the one that Abram rescued, said to Abram, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. Don't miss that. Give me all the souls, you take all the goods. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I've raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I made Abraham rich, except only what the young men have eaten and the portion of the men who were with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their portion. What's going on here? So just listen to it. Satan's starting to bargain through the king of Sodom. Give me the persons, you take the goods. I want people. The king of Sodom wants souls. By the way, the king of Sodom is synonymous with Satan himself. I want souls in exchange for spoils. Don't miss it. One of my visions that I had when I was in my coma two years ago, my very first vision, was I was sitting in an altar and I was in a chair. And I won't tell you the whole vision in detail, but I was looking out and I could hear Satan behind me and he was coming at me. It was a horrible vision. 
and I kept seeing these souls in my mind's eyes. I kept seeing souls, people that I had preached to, and I kept seeing them over and over, hundreds of them, thousands of them. And I kept hearing this voice behind me saying, give me the souls and I'll allow you to live. Give me the souls and I'll allow you. And honestly, I was frightened in the dream, in the vision. I was very frightened. And I was wondering what to do. Do I give him these souls? He wanted those souls. And when I read this, when I was studying it, it came all back to me. That's what he wants. He wants souls. He doesn't care about monies and riches. He wants souls. He's telling Abram, I want, so you can saw him saying, I want the souls. But Abram has learned Egypt is a poor substitute for eternity. He's a dynamic Christian. And he knows, look at verse 22. I have lifted up my hand to God. I will not take from your tainted world. What a tremendous stand. Now look, there went Abram, a dynamic believer, new spiritual growth. And there went Lot. What happened to Lot? Well, you'll soon see as we go through Genesis, he's going back down to Sodom. He's going to live in it. No doubt, taking what Abram turned down. I believe Lot was actually richer than Abram. I believe he took the goods. And promoted and advanced. You only promoted the wealthy. It's like Rome. The senators were the wealthiest people in Rome. Well, we know he's advanced because you're going to read about him being having a seat in Sodom's gate. He's, have a, he's, a, he's now a political leader and he will dwell there. Okay, let me sum it up for you. Genesis chapter 14. And let me sum it before I give you my application. So number one, over to the right side of the bottom of this thing. Four kings travel west to punish the rebels. Enemies to the east and south are subdued. Two, battle of Sidim occurs. Five kings fall in the pits. You remember last week. The spoils and lots are and lot is taken. Chedorlaomer returns north with spoils and captives. Third, upper left the cor corner of this chart. Abram and 318 servants pursue, rout the four kings, recover spoils and souls. Four, Abram met by Melchizedek, king of Salem, with bread and wine. Abram gives him 10 percent. Five, Abram met by the king of Sodom, who offers Abram the spoils of Sodom. That's chapter 14. Some of you have been passed up for jobs. What's our application for promotions? You got the short end of the stick, so to speak. Stop kicking and fighting. It's time for you to start claiming and faithing what God has promised you. Will Abraham get more blessings of God? Absolutely. Will he be left alone by the enemy? Absolutely not. Let me say this in closing. Wishy-washy believers are often amazed and afraid of what life brings them. That's a lot. He's gonna live his life afraid. While truly faithful believers, dynamic believers, live their lives amazed and ablaze with God's provisions. That's Abram. He gives up what the world has to offer to live by faith. Let me repeat it. He gives up what the world has to offer to live by faith. It is by far the best rate of return because it always pays off in spiritual and yes, even physical blessings. So let me ask you tonight, what worldly offer have you received lately? At what cost? What are you compromising? I read you article after article. The church in America is compromising today. They're compromising world popularity for Christianity. They're compromising. It's a bad deal. It's a real bad deal. It's not a, it's not a unique deal. Satan's been trying to offer the compromise ever since Abram and Lot, Adam and Eve. He's been trying to have it. Will you give up worldly advantage if it compromises your godly stance? It's a poor trade-off. What does a man gain if he, if he gains the whole world and leaves his own soul, Jesus said. Mark chapter 10 Jesus said, most assuredly, more certainly I tell you, there's no one that's left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or land for my sake and for the sake of, God, of the good news, the gospel, who will receive 100 times more now in this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and land with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. Possessors of heaven and earth. When you give up for God, you become like Abraham. You become a possessor of heaven and earth. You have a bank account on, on the earth that God blesses, and you got a bank account in heaven that he blesses. Not necessarily without persecution, though. So, let me remind you. Faith and doubt. Next week, before I put this up, next week, you don't want to miss it. I'm chapter 15, when doubt tests your faith. Satan's not done with Abram yet. When doubt tests your faith. Does doubt ever test your faith? Well, I'm going to tell you next week about this. Faith and doubt go hand in hand, by the way. If you have faith and you think, oh, I'm doubting. Faith and doubt go hand in hand. They are complementaries. One who never doubts will never truly have faith. So next week we will be talking about that. 
Thank you for coming to being with us tonight. I know I'm going to get a lot of letters, a lot of emails about Melchizedek. I pray that you follow it. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Let me pray for you and your family. Father, again, I thank you and I praise you for these lessons of faith, for growing our faith tonight, Lord God. Bless everyone that's listened, Lord God. I pray blessings on every man, woman, child, Lord God, within earshot, Lord God. Bless their families, Lord. Thank you for this study. Bring us back again next week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us tonight.